Welcome to season two, episode four of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Thank you for the students who showed up today to grow personally and professionally. I know you guys have a lot of priorities, other homework, other classes, jobs, family, and maybe you're still reeling from the binge Super Bowl party that you went to this weekend on the Bucks Super Bowl win. So a reminder that this community was created for you to support each other, to grow personally and professionally. And I'm happy that you're here because you could be at a lot of other places. And much like uh, the entrepreneurship and innovation program where we develop professionals who create their own businesses. And if you go down central in St. Pete or all along Tampa, uh, people from our program and from USF have created these businesses. But we've also talked about how it's not exclusive. You can work for a company and you can be an inner innovator within a firm managing new products, new services. And we're very familiar with all the companies that constantly bombard us to purchase their products, their services, or new businesses that, that evolve from this uh, idea of innovation and, and driving market value. And then lastly, we create individuals who define and create careers themselves, not what others define for them. And our next guest is doing a combination of all of those throughout his career. So I'm really grateful uh, to have our next guest. And he's really a role model for me and someone who's embedded in the community. And I've been very fortunate to work with him over the past several years. And I know students, you hate working in groups. And I'm not sure adults have any different opinion, but there's people that you meet as you work in groups that make you better and make others better. And our next guest makes others better all the time and whoever he's working with. He's a technologist, he's a social media influencer, he's got a Twitter following that kind of almost rivals Kim Kardashian, and he's possibly the most likable guy that I've ever met. So please give a warm welcome to Fred Stubbe, a USF MBA alum and former leader of digital transformation at Cox Target Media. So let's give uh, Fred Stubbe a round of applause, and we do this in sign language because oftentimes we're, we're on mute. <laughs> so, Fred, welcome. Thank you for joining us this Tuesday Thank morning. You. Where does this cast find you? And maybe you can bring us up to speed on what you've been working on or a bit about your journey that, that can incite us. Sure. Well, thank you for that warm introduction. The feeling is mutual, uh, Steve. Um, it's It's been great working with you, having worked on a number of innovation sessions. Um, Right now, finds me at home. Um, I live out on Bel Air Beach in Pinellas County in the great championship city of Tampa Bay. Um, right now, I'm in semi-retirement, although I do some consulting. Um, I, uh, I have a, you know, I guess you would call a significant uh, network. And I've worked with some of the past CEOs that I've worked with, um, but with uh, COVID hitting, that put a hamper on a lot of the consulting. Um, I am on the board of directors for a company called Social Pay. It's a digital payments platform, a wallet. Uh, so I do a little work with them. Um, I'm helping a, a startup company called uh, Heavenly Hash Creamery. They're a, a premium ice cream. They also have CBD in it. Um, so they're uh, a nice little startup. And then I do a lot of trading. I'm not a day trader, so I'm more of a, an investor. And then I do everything I can to continue my education. Uh, I've um, certainly got my undergraduate in anthropology and MBA um, from the University of South Florida. I've done some uh, certificate work at Harvard, MIT, and then some all, some additional continuing education at Stanford, just online. Um, really want to keep those skills sharp, keep my network uh, strong, and uh, that's where I am today. When I first met you, you were at Valpac, and you came to our innovation class, and you shared a bit about the role that you were playing at Valpac. And maybe you could share a bit about what Valpac is and explain a bit sure. about your role there, because a lot of my students do go on to work at, at as innovators for companies. And we're curious to know, as someone who's been leading this trail of breadcrumbs for us to follow, how did you find yourself and how did you make your way into that role? Yeah, great question. So I was uh, an archaeologist for 10 years. I left archaeology, you know, frankly, I still love it. It's the study of ancient technology. I moved into a role of 
uh, studying modern or future technology. But how I got started with Cox was I worked for several technology companies back in the late 90s. We went through the internet boom and then bust. So my company uh, that I worked for back then was acquired, then acquired by another company. And then finally with the dot-com crunch, uh, they let go of that business unit. Um, I then found myself at uh, Valpac. Uh, Valpac is a direct mail company. Uh, the largest uh, local level mail company uh, in the planet. I think we were uh, the number four mailer for the post office at one point. Uh, circulation has decreased since uh, I've been there, not because I'm no longer there, but as a natural result of uh, the attrition of uh, print advertising. Um, and so I found myself uh, with uh, Valpac in the early 2000s, stayed there for a year. I was married at the time. My wife got a great job out in California. So we moved out there for a little bit and I left the Cox family. Cox Enterprises is, uh, gosh, you know, they got to be close to $30 billion company now. They own um, Mannheim Auto Auctions and Auto Trader, Cox Cable. We were in the Cox Media Group uh, family that had TV, radio, newspaper, and then print. That was Valpac, played that role. Having left uh, uh, for California in the 2000s, I started up a, um, a real estate investment company, take advantage of that boom, did very well. But with that crunch, I rejoined Cox in 2008. Now, I had an MBA. I had a wealth of experience, but I went in as a marketing uh, manager level. Um, while I was there, I saw all these great opportunities to take this brand to the next level. So Valpac said that um, blue coupon envelope that you find in your mail once a month, at least here in the U.S. Uh, we used to be in other parts of the globe, but right now it's the U.S. and parts of Canada. And um, one of the first things I saw as a technology that was interesting was augmented reality. So I, find my, I found myself in a position where I'm just doing the daily grind as a marketing manager. What else can we harness in terms of technology that will give our sales team something to talk about? So it was kind of a door opener. So I put together a uh, concept paper flew it up through my boss, who brought it to their boss, who brought it to their boss, eventually brought it up to Cox leadership. And that really began to set the stage for my career advancement at Cox. Target Wonderful. Belt. I'd like to highlight to the, to the students. So here, here's an example where Fred has worked for startups and they've gone boom and bust. And then he finds himself back at, at Cox Media at a, a role that Maybe it wouldn't be the ideal fit based off of experience, but he said, hey, how do I get noticed? How do I create a, a, a path within uh, Cox Media that can get me some uh, some light, some some uh, traction that could you know, build my own career? So he got, went above and beyond outside of his duty. He saw the opportunity through the different technology, start making what he calls these concepts or briefs, which all of you should know what those are since we use those in our classes as we define our projects, et cetera. So this is how he's trying to gain experience and, and create a path within this behemoth of a company. So I'm curious, what role is, we'll say, concepting or concept briefs that you create or prototyping have played in your experience there? Because my students are expected to do that five times throughout the semester and you know to ba basically be able to communicate their ideas and i'm trying to get them comfortable with this iterative process but what role did it play for you yeah so it was really huge so it's one thing if you hear about artificial intelligence you can't just go to a leader or um, another individual say you're on a board say um, you're with some other organization you just can't spew terms, you really have to um, do a little background yourself, um, identify the needs within the organization that you want to advance this idea in, and then try to say, what problem will this solve? What are the pain points that we're experiencing? What is the opportunity?
this product, this service, this idea. It doesn't have to be a big grand idea, but it does have to play a role in solving a problem for the organization. So for me, um, I did, a, uh, this was back in 2009. Um, the iPhone had um, come out very recently. It wasn't enabled for augmented reality. You had to use a webcam, but I said, um, I went to, um, I partnered with somebody else within the organization um, and um, he ran promotions. So I said, well, hey, why don't you go to Martha Stewart? Here's the idea. We could, you know, put an image on the envelope. The camera will see the envelope. The software in the background recognizes a certain image. It's a pattern. It then triggers other software. It would play a video um, and then allow people to enter into a contest. So once I got the conceptual buy-in from this gentleman named Chris Bellotta, uh from the Martha Stewart uh, media folks, I then was able to say, okay, we have buy-in from an outside group. We can do this. It won't have much of an incremental cost. I looked at the technology players that could provide that. There was a local group here, HD Interactive. They're still here. They're doing great things with VR and AR in the Tampa Bay area. And, you know, I got a bid. I, I put it, I articulated it. I did some quick mock-ups. They weren't pretty. Um, put that in a paper and said, here are the benefits to the organization. Here are the risks. You know, what if it doesn't work? What if not enough people have webcams? Uh, but you have to be really honest and say, you know, here is the opportunity. It's a next-gen technology. It'll open doors for our sales folks. It'll create some excitement with people. We'll get some media airtime because Martha Stewart would promote it at the time. And um, I got buy-in. Now, it's real important you work through your channels. Um, but uh, I let my boss know it was over her head. She didn't understand technology, but she appreciated and trusted that this would work and took it to my boss. And then eventually it went up from there. And that just kind of sets the stage. You then, if you're able to execute, so that's the other thing. It's one thing to come up with a concept paper, but you have to be willing to work those nights and weekends, which I did to make sure that the execution is flawless or as, as much as you can control. I'd like to relate this to what the students are going through. So both in my scalability class, they have a challenge that they're looking to solve in the Tampa Bay community. And in the student design or student consulting and design thinking, they have another challenge, but they're doing very much like this concepting. We're not necessarily doing a physical paper, but certainly a slide deck, mock-ups, this iterative approach expected to do the research. So I hope the students are able to see this direct connection between what actually happens in practice and why you have to go through this iterative process of communicating your idea, doing the research, identifying the problem. Because if we don't identify the problem and the very niche problem, we may not yeah. get by and we may be solving too big of a problem and it just becomes overbearing to, to, to move forward or to scale or to, uh, so thank you for sharing that. Sure. A lot, right, right now, innovation is hot. Entrepreneurship is hot. We place people like Elon Musk on a pedestal, the Zuck, Bill Gates, of course, and it's quite sexy, but we want to know the dirt. What is unsexy about innovation right now? What is, yeah, un so lift, lift up the hood, what is unsexy and dirty? Yeah, I mean, you can look uh, across industries um, and, and see the pitfalls, but some of the pitfalls are, um, you, it's, First of all, you must be able to execute. Like I said, um, you have to be able to implement this. Um, at least take it as far along as you can before the organization says, great idea, we love it, we may not be ready for it now. But you have to get it to that point and meet your budget and meet your timeframes. Um, so I would say the difficulties or what's ugly is very often, um, you can go through an ideation session, a design thinking session. I've led those at my organization. I've led them at other organizations. And a lot of people get excited by, hey, you know, this was a really great idea. Like I had an idea. Let's embed some tags into video content through Cox Cable 
then whenever people are watching a program, they could see an outfit, they could um, find out where it's sold, how much it costs, what that location is. Can I book travel? Great idea represented, you know, potentially a huge amounts of uh, economic benefit, but the organization's not ready to implement it. So, you know, I guess the ugly thing behind it is you can come up with a great idea, but if, if the organization that you're working with is not ready or if priorities shift, um, you just have to take it in stride. It's not a personal thing. You carry it as far as you can and you move on to the next thing or stay at it. Uh, you know, I've been um, turned down for ideas and you just, I didn't do a good enough job conveying the benefit. And so you have to stay at it and keep at it. This is excellent. So a lot of, uh, or at least my experience, and I'm sure the students experience as they enter the industry and companies, one of the biggest challenges is always managing upward or getting that buy-in from managers. Do you have any tips? Because I know you reported the CIO and the CEO, and I'm wondering how do you get that, that, that champion behind you of top leadership to help you push those ideas along? Do you have any tips for us? Um, good question. Um, I would say uh, professional networking is one of the most important things that you can do. Conferences, at work, classmates. I'm still in touch with a lot of my MBA classmates, um, Steve and I, uh, as just small examples. So, you know, I would say as a, a junior employee, um, I would be very careful as you navigate corporate politics. Uh, very often, some bosses who may not possess the same skills may feel threatened or slighted if you were to just go knock on the CEO's door and say, hey, do you want to grab lunch? It may be um, innocent, like, hey, you know, I really respect the CEO. I'd like to hear his thoughts. It gives you an opportunity to advance ideas. So, so you know, really treading that political uh, um, potential landmines is very difficult. I always went ahead and networked myself. Um, it was intimidating. I was manager level as I worked my way up through director level at a $30 billion company. Um, it was difficult, but I always let my leaders know, hey, I'm doing this and here's why. Sometimes it's like, well, you know, that's not really a good idea, but at least I, I, I could live with myself. The importance of doing this, of meeting other leaders, and this includes leaders outside of um, your organization, whether it's uh, um, University of South Florida with, you know, you've got two leaders right there on this call, uh, good people to know, but uh, you can meet other leaders at conferences and you just have to take that risk. You have to introduce yourself, just start off easy. You know, a lot of these guys get bombarded with requests, but I think it's really important to at least um, make an introduction, introduce yourself, uh, and when the time is right, then you can go through a, a light pitch and then follow channels properly. Excellent. I think that's very practical advice because we will be facing those challenges and how to deal with, we'll say, institutional uh, power structures or social structures. Sure. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, since many of the students that I know in my class have side hustles or have their own businesses or in the future will have their own business, I, I want to you to share a bit about what your experience is with the Tampa Bay entrepreneurship ecosystem, or is there anything that you can say about it that, I don't know, you know, here's where we are in terms of, of growth or here, here's where we are in terms of what we do well and maybe what we don't do so well in and because I know you're out there and I know you know a lot of people in the community. Is there any things that you can share that say, you know, we're doing this well or this is how we'd explain it and share? Yeah, I mean, within uh, Tampa Bay, so we've got a large uh, medical uh, healthcare uh, startup scene going on right now, a lot of technology. It's really an interesting hotbed. Um, I had started out my uh, MBA program with wanting to start my own healthcare company, and then I, I just got into technology with the internet space. But you know, they've now crossed over and married. So 
I think it's really interesting. The healthcare startup scene in Tampa Bay is really strong. There's a lot of interesting things with uh, the Internet of Things, IoT, um, and with uh, wearable technology, um, you know, without going into all the potential future scenarios, I would say keep an eye on that. That's a great growth area. If any of you are interested in innovation and um, are intrigued by the healthcare industry, that'd be an interesting field. Uh, we also have AR and VR, a lot of uh, core technology. It's part of this larger initiative between Orlando and Tampa Bay, trying to start up this innovation corridor along I-4. It's got a ways to go, but that's still a big uh, focus for the two, this region of Florida. Finance um, is also another hotbed of innovation in this area. Um, and then lastly, I'll say, um, is, is, as it is to say, the cannabis industry. Um, that's, uh, a, there's a lot of very interesting startups in the Tampa Bay area. My girlfriend happens to uh, own that ice cream company, that um, Heavenly Hash Creamery. Uh, she's doing a lot of very interesting things with the health benefits of just CBD. Um, so uh, I, I would say those are areas of um, interesting focus. And then, you know, sports management. Um, it's just kind of interesting that sure. I would say that after we win another championship <laughs> here. But um, I know the Tampa campus has a, a strong program, um, a master's level um, in sports management. Uh, so it, it's just interesting to see these new areas fall. Excellent. Uh, maybe the students are familiar with some of those industries more than others, but these are opportunities. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to talk about something that um, I follow. I follow you on Twitter and you have a great following. And you're always putting out great information. And I know a lot of my students are also using social media. How did you get your mass following and how has that helped you or both personally and professionally or learning or whatever? But I know you do that regularly or at least have in the past. And, you know, what what role being this type of influencer and, and in this ter certain space of technology has played and what benefit does it have? Or would you recommend that for for future entrepreneurs, innovators or students? Oh, so I would. Uh, I would recommend that all students uh, avail themselves of social media platforms. Um, you know, just, you know, bear in mind, um, certainly we saw this with the U.S. elections. You have to kind of watch what you're reading. But if you're authentic and you have a particular voice, you have a particular niche, a particular um, uh, area you want to share information about, um, I found Twitter to be real easy. I use uh, Facebook and Instagram differently as well as Snapchat. Um, but with me, how I built up my following was, A, I was authentic. So whatever I did, um, uh, whatever posts I post, and I invite you guys to go take a look at it. It's uh, the at symbol uh, Stuby. Um, I just steadily posted. So having a regular cadence to your post. Uh, this also um, ties in with, you know, professional networks and, and networking. You need to be authentic, have some great content, know what it is you're talking about, um, and then be regular with it. And, you know, all these things require um, feeding and caring. And so that's really what I did over time. I just found the, the best posts, the things that interested me. Um, as far as specifically building up a following, I would follow a lot of other influencers. Some of them would follow me. Sometimes I would tag them out of vanity. They may then retweet it. It's just a good strategy. Sometimes I do that as well. Somebody else tags me on a tweet like, hey, you know, I was inspired by at Stuby you know, for this thing. And it's like, oh, well, okay, that appeals to my vanity. We're all human. And um, so just using that formula um, allowed me to, to grow my follower base into the tens of thousands. Great. Um, so that's something that we can do right now that pays off dividends over the long run. Okay. And Fred suggesting, you know, maybe pick a niche and be authentic, find your voice which is a common theme within innovation, both your own voice and the stories that, you, that you're telling. 
So I'd like to prime the audience or students if they have questions. I'm going to ask, and then I'm going to ask Fred one more question. Then we'll 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 open up for a game maybe. But uh, so think about what questions you might have. So let's play a game with the audience and with Fred. And it will just it's a simple game. I'm going to introduce a concept or or a company or a technology or whatever. And for those who are have video on, uh, you can just go thumbs up or thumbs down. Or if you don't have video on or even if you, you can do thumbs up or thumbs down with the emoji and then I'll ask Fred. So we're going to play this game of what does the crowd think? What does Fred think in terms of this technology? And then if you're the same, why, why up, why down, Fred? And we'll go from there. So let's ask the crowd first. Cryptocurrency, thumbs up or thumbs down? Is it going to take off if it hasn't already in the next uh, sh near, near short term? We, we had one side, most are saying up. Fred, what do you say and why? Uh, thumbs up, huge thumbs up. Um, so, uh, cryptocurrency will, you know, help to, I, I, I don't know if it'll completely replace, I mean, um, you know, if you look back in time, some original forms of uh, currency were uh, beads, you see that in shells in the Pacific uh, Islands. Um, they're not still widely used right now, but <laughs> one could make a case for jewelry as being a form of currency. Um, so the opportunity for a blockchain and cryptocurrencies coming in uh, that will disrupt the financial systems in time. Uh, it costs a lot to maintain a currency. Um, it's easier to um, be fraudulent with it than it is with uh, our current blockchain um, setups with Bitcoin. I happen to own um, both Bitcoin, uh, Ripple, Ethereum, and Bitcoin Cash, I happen to believe in it, um, so. Okay. Uh, there's always, historically, AI hasn't delivered on its promise. I'm gonna ask the crowd, AI, thumbs up, thumbs down, or sideways, I guess is an option now. We got two thumbs up over here, thumbs up, thumbs up. We got some people still thinking, there's no right or wrong answer. We're making predictions. Fred, what do you say? Uh, thumbs up, so. Um... AI, artificial intelligence, and deep learning, and uh, machine intelligence, um, that is going to be the biggest disruptor, I think, on our society in the next 100 years. Um, there's many that expect the first trillionaires to come out of the AI space. Um, it will help businesses with their decision making. Um, it will become a huge part of marketing. You can truly get down to the one-to-one -one marketing with recognition and the internet of things where, you know, again, another concept I had that I wrote up in a paper that wasn't um, taken to the next level was, you know, outdoor advertising. They'll all be connected. They'll all have cameras. As you pull up in a particular vehicle, whether it's autonomous or other, um, and it can recognize your face. You know, they'll be able to do this from very vast differences, it recognizes you, hits a database, sees all your likes, it then serves up very personalized advertisement. The same thing with upsales of products. So huge, cool. huge, huge, huge. I mean, that's just tip of the iceberg. How about cancer cure? Gonna, gonna ask the audience, will we see regulation of big tech this year? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs down, thumbs down. Seen a lot of thumbs down. Fred, will there be regulation or big tech this year? Um, I'm going with thumbs down now because we're still in an economic recovery. Could it happen within this administration? Maybe. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats have both uh, expressed concern, but um, we'll just have to see. I don't think it's if, I think it's when. I think some of the social media companies and some of the other big tech companies would almost welcome what the rules are uh, so that they can navigate mm -hmm. through that as opposed sure. to like, oh, well, you know, they get okay. um, But there's also the other side of the argument, breaking some of them up might unleash uh, new rounds of, of, of innovation, not so different than the historic baby bells and, and, and other regulated uh, historical events. So Agreed, agreed. So, and it creates more value for those shareholders yeah. that 
own the parent company because they get a little bit of each one that's broken up. Uh, one social media platform that's been around for a while that hasn't gotten a lot of play historically, but recently has uh, been part been the platform for a movement with GameStop and AMC. And I know many of my students have own own these stocks, and I see some smiling. <laughs> so, will Reddit become a dominant social media force uh, this year? If it hasn't already, I don't know. Thumbs up or thumbs down to the to the audience. Thumbs down. Thumbs. I'm seeing. I'm seeing mixed mixed results. Fred, are you on Reddit? Uh, I am on Reddit, but I'm not super active. Um, it, you know, I, I take it like anything else I read um, on social media with a grain of salt. You have to consider the source. So, uh, will it become a major factor? You know, I think big time in the sun has already kind of occurred. They'll still do little things to disrupt uh, trading. I think it's important that we have that. I think it was a benefit, but I, I don't think they'll okay. supplant other okay. large social. Um, next technology. VR, AR. Students, thumbs up or thumbs down? Will it, will it take off this year if it hasn't already, I guess? Fred, you're the only person that I ever knew that had the Google glasses. What's going on? VR going, AR going up or down? Um, I have the Oculus as part of a project. Yeah. It's impressive, but I, I, I don't know. Unless I'm gaming on it, it's hard for me to see the usefulness of it. Yeah, so I'm going to do it sideways. I mean, it, I think if Apple comes out with an AR version, <laughs> I think that will open it up to the masses. Um, you know, price points of these headsets and the software is pretty expensive. Um, it, I mean, you kind of go back to, is it solving a problem right now or is it purely entertainment? How much are you willing to pay for entertainment? One could have made the case that AR and VR, AR and VR might have taken off last year with everyone stuck at home and being able to travel virtually. Problem is we just don't have enough content. So if you think about the early days of any technology, you get a bunch of people moving into the space because the barriers to entry are very easy. They come up with these fragmented, disjointed, um, non-integrated systems. So everyone's got separate platforms. And until you have a few that emerge that can, where the space consolidates, and adoption is large enough, it begins to solve problems or present other benefits. Um, I, I, I don't think this is going to be the big year for it unless Apple does something. Prices have to come down and more content has to be available. So wouldn't it be great if everyone could take a virtual trip somewhere and you know do it for less than $100, go to the south pacific in time the technology will be better you'll have a little you know all kinds of uh, wearables and you'll have other sensory experiences that we don't currently have now when that content at that level becomes more pervasive and affordable then um, it will become very widespread i think that's a great example um, i know in the entrepreneurship program we have a study abroad to venice that that Dr. Lieber's um, leads, maybe there's a way to flip that under these constraints and say, can we have a virtual study abroad using VR, AR, or whatever as a low cost provider to those who might not be able to afford it as well? So, great, great example. So, I'm going to ask the audience and Fred one more, and then we're going to open the floor to questions for uh, anyone who has one. So, this is not technology related, but it is a heated debate within the community. So I'm going to ask the students in the next, I think, three or four years, will the Rays stay in St. Pete or will they leave? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up if they stay, thumbs down if they leave. Getting some mixed, mixed results, but Fred? Uh, do they stay or do they leave? Not technology based, but I'm definitely just going to say a prayer for it. <laughs> okay. you know, I hope they stay. <laughs> the, the Hail Mary. Wonderful. That's right. That's right. So uh, who has a question for Fred? This is a great time to pick his brain. Someone who's walked before us that we can learn from. Feel free to raise your hand or jump on uh, and ask Fred a question. 
Hey, so, oh, sorry, Austin, you can go first if you want. Oh, no, you go ahead. It's okay. Oh, okay, thanks. Well, so I was just going to ask you, like, in regard to your um, social media platforms, you know, you talked about being authentic and, um, you know, finding like a common theme, like within your posts. So how did you figure out what you wanted your brand to be on these social media platforms? Yeah, uh, great question. So uh, it took me a little bit, you know, I just kind of went out there, I would post personal pics in LinkedIn. And then, you know, somebody chided me for doing that. I subsequently unfollowed that person, but it made sense, right? I mean, there are a um, I'm not going to say appropriate, but there's relevant content for each one of these channels. So with, I, I just kind of learned that over time. I, you know, there was no rule book. It was early days for me. I, I joined and grabbed the, the Stuby uh, handle on most of these platforms very early on. Um, and uh, I just found that the interactions I would get with other users as I, so say, for example, LinkedIn, I get most of my uh, comments or likes off of career-based things. Uh, I also throw in technology where I can get it, but LinkedIn's not really good at serving video content. So I went from putting out my own prognostications on Twitter. I then found that, oh, images, every time I uploaded an image with a post, I got a 4X um, interaction with that. And then I found, oh, when I do a video, I get a 10 X versus a text-based one. So it was kind of an iteration for me. Um, and with, uh, you know, with Facebook, I consider that semi personal. I used to do technology posts on that. I no longer do that because most of the people I know on Facebook really don't care. They'd rather see, you know, pictures or at least the interaction that I have I get more interaction with more personal adventure based things versus Twitter is very technology. Instagram is more like Facebook. LinkedIn is very professional. Snapchat can be whatever. Um, I don't have a big following there. Um, it's mostly uh, family and friends. So, Austin? Um, I was just going to ask, it's kind of not, well, I mean, it is related to social media, um, but what's your like thoughts on cybersecurity and how they, how that kind of plays a factor in, um, I guess, social media? Um, so, um, how cybersecurity plays a role in social media. Uh, well, it's it's going to be important. I always worry about somebody coming in and hacking me um, and, you know, posting as me and then ruining my brand or my online identity in that regard. I mean, the same thing applies with, you know, credit and financial things. So um, I'm not sure where cybersecurity will go from there, but from a broader um public policy perspective, I think that's one of the greatest needs. I mean, it's kind of funny. The United States of America spends um, literally, I don't know, six to eight hundred billion dollars on its military or its defense program. It's larger than the next eight countries combined, which includes India, and China, and Russia. And the fact that we just have this massive hack um, recently that was very pervasive across our society, I think there's, there's really going to be a, a huge need to, to tie down. And I think wars in the future will be precipitated by a, a cyber attack. But uh, that may be off topic to what you asked, but I think there's bigger societal implications. Yeah. What's, inter what, what's interesting, Fred, that you brought up, Last season, we brought a, a, a USF MBA alum who's an ex-CIA spy, an agent, and he talked about that. And he, he compared governments to be very much like individuals. We all have our weak spots that we can get in. And he said in the, when he was working, they would talk about the, 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 the position between people's toes as being a very important pressure point that you can get access. Well, that's how the solar, the solar company was the the little spot between the government's toes that someone was able to plant something and get access to our government information and data and infrastructure. So I think it's very relevant. And in fact, we, we've, we've, we've been able to have that topic 
uh, appear um, on on our on our open educator. So wonderful. Who else has a question for Fred? Before I, I have two more questions, but uh, I want to give you guys time to to pick his brain. Okay, so I had a question. Um, it was about what you said earlier that you can come up with a good idea and put work into it. And then still the company will not like accept it because of priorities or budget at the time. I was wondering like one that has happened to you in the past, how you maintain your confidence. Can you hear us? Yeah, I think he froze up. Okay. That's a good question. So maybe, yeah. Oh, yeah, probably knocked off. Let's. Uh, oh, he's gone. Yeah. So let's uh, let's sidebar that, or I'll put you in touch, Adriana, uh, for um, w with Fred. Okay, no problem. Cool, cool. Dirk, would you, would you like to say a few things? Thank you for being here, and for joining us. Uh, I know. So for for those who don't know or came in late, uh, Dr. Liebers is the director of the Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, he is also overseeing the program for the Masters of Entrepreneurship Applied. Maybe you could share a bit about what that program is about. So we at the center, we have uh, a number of uh, educational programs. We have an undergraduate program, a major in entrepreneurship. We also have a minor in entrepreneurship, if you're interested in that. Uh, at the graduate level, we have a certificate in, in entrepreneurship. Uh, it consists of four courses, 12 credits. And uh, if you want to go on and complete your, your master's degree, you can apply actually these four courses towards your master's degree, which is a 10 course uh, program actually. So uh, the program is currently ranked number nine uh, among public universities. Uh, so I think that's uh, pretty good uh, given uh, the competition we have. Uh, and then in the fall, we expect our master's program, the identical degree to offer in Venice, Italy. We work with the University of uh, Venice over there and with a private uh, organization uh, called Hage Farm. And they build out like a brand new uh, campus uh, exclusively dedicated to entrepreneurship and innovation. So some of our USF students can spend uh, like a whole semester there in Venice, uh, attractive option, I think. Hopefully by then the pandemic will be uh, tamped down and uh, we can go about our lives as, uh, as we used to. Um, we also offer study abroad programs. Uh, my program to Barcelona was just canceled among, um, you know, along with uh, many other programs uh, offered by USF, but Hopefully next year uh, I will try again to go to Barcelona and that's a city that uh, your professor knows very well. He uh, spent many years there. It's a very attractive uh, city, uh, has a high tech economy, has some great universities. Uh, it's a very touristy place. It's a beautiful city too, uh, beautiful architecture. They have uh, this cathedral that they have been working on for like uh, many, many hundreds of years. I think they started in 1870 or 1860, and they're still actually working on it. Uh, our friend is, is back. Good. <laughs> um, and then uh, we collaborate with USF Connect and operate uh, the uh, Student Innovation Incubator, and Sienna is, is uh, familiar with that. So typically in a year, in an academic year, we receive around, around 85 to 90 applications. And we select 30 to 35, sometimes even 40 students to uh, locate the venture in the Student innova Innovation Incubator. Uh, they get matched up with a mentor. We have a series of uh, seminars uh, and we hope to uh, bring the investment community, investor community closer to the USF uh, internal ecosystem as well. Uh, to have students, uh, you know, the opportunity to uh, receive some uh, maybe seed seed funding, for example. Great. And then we have the NSF I Corps program uh, that Sienna went through. It's a six-week uh, program. It's uh, managed by two instructors, Dr. Richard, I think, and and Dr. Berman. 
and they take you through a whole customer discovery process. You know, you have an idea, but is there a real uh, customer or a set of customers for, for this particular product or service, right? So it's a discovery process and it's a lot, it takes you a little bit out of your comfort zone. You actually need to interact with uh, the real world. And this is how you discover whether there's a real problem or whether there's a customer need that uh, that is worthwhile uh, to develop a product or a solution for and then commercialize this. So I, I, I hope I didn't perfect. take too much it, of your time. No, 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 that's perfect. So there are a lot of opportunities uh, connected to the Center for Entrepreneurship. Um, you can see how what you're doing in the classroom relates and extends beyond uh, the classroom and you can continuously build your skills. And as Dr. Lieber has mentioned, I, I cannot stress enough the opportunities or the growth that happens if you choose to use learning to travel and study abroad. I've spent seven years abroad uh, in Barcelona and, and London and, and even France. Um, the skills, the person that you will become uh, will be, you'll be bigger, better, uh, your heart will grow, your mind will grow, and you'll be around uh, global like-minded people. Um, so if that's an opportunity or something or a pathway, if you're trying to look how to travel and grow professionally, th these are good paths to, to, to take. And, and uh, I could not, I'm testimony to what that, what that means. So thank you, Dr. Liebers. And I have one more question for Fred. Is Fred, Fred back on? I am. Sorry good. about that. My no fault. No, no problem, no problem. Um, I always round out the, the session asking our guests this, but if you could go back in time and give your younger self some advice, what would you say to him, particularly in your, you know, maybe your 20s or schooling time? What, what would you say? What advice would you would you give yourself? Um, you know, I I think it's how I lived my life, but I would make sure I do this. So I would be passionate about whatever it is that I do professionally, personally, uh, just, you know, go full into it, have drive, um, develop um, a vision for yourself and um, go, go execute it. And then the importance of networking is really important. So I started out I come from a family of uh, surgeons. You know, I was named after my grandfather, who was an orthopedic surgeon. My cousin, um, Fritz, was also named after him. He married a beautiful woman from Ecuador and studied music and got his PhD. Uh, I, you know, switched over to anthropology, but I had a passion for it. I just didn't have the passion for what I thought I was going to do. And I, I think a lot of that extends into or permeates um, organizational culture and certainly your, your personal life. Just, you know, have drive, have a vision, have passion. It's, it's served me well, at least. Fred, I can't thank you enough for spending the morning with us. Uh, thank you for your wisdom and, and connecting. Is there a way that the students can connect with you beyond this session? Uh, certainly. So um, can certainly uh, follow me on Twitter and just kind of see the latest weird, geeky future technology. Um, I tweet about all kinds of funky future based stuff. But um, my email, if, if that's um, shareable with the team, you know, I'm happy to field questions or, or what have you. Uh, LinkedIn is another good place to connect with me. Perfect. I know, Sienna, we send out a newsletter to all our students about a recap of what happened today, and we'll include your your um, email. So if you get a lot of spam, you know why. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I can't thank you enough. Let's circle Thanks back and having... connect uh, shortly. But um, cool. thank you again. And for, for those who have questions about uh, class, we're going to spend some time about any questions that you might have. So thank you, Fred. So this is not goodbye. This is see you later or see you soon. Thank you, Fred. Okay, thank all you so best. much. It was nice to meet you all. Thank nice you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Hopefully you guys thought that was useful. Fred, you know, before there was jobs regularly open, and I've sent many of you, right, the, this list that comes in LinkedIn for me, all mm -hmm. the jobs that deal with innovation, design thinking, you know, Orlando, man, whatever. He was trying to create these careers before there was job titles for him. 
So he knows quite a bit, and hopefully you, you got a sense of all the different things that he's been working on and had to go through. That's kind of paved the way for for many of the other people. And um, he's also, you know, he's got a lot of other good stories. But because of time, we were we we, we only had to cut that short. But uh, thank you. Who's got questions for for class? I know we've had some things due. Uh, I'll be reviewing your final research presentations. Hopefully you guys see why you're doing the research up front to identify if there's a need, if there's a problem, and then what that problem is in the niche for, for scalability and for design thinking. What other questions might you have? Would anyone like to ask a question? You can just talk. You guys know, all right, excellent. That means you guys are doing great in class. I've seen your videos, the ones in creativity and innovation. Don't you guys agree? When you watch those videos, you see how talented the students are. We have a student who makes custom shoes. We have another student who's got a pizzeria and a, an Amazon dropship business. We have another who makes music and other, I mean, there was just an endless group of students who, who are hustling in various different ways. Um, and I know many more will, will haven't even shared what you guys are interested in. So you could see how talented students are here at USF. So kudos to you guys. If you don't have any more questions, last opportunity, of course, you can we can meet uh, or email me questions or whatever, you know, where you guys get a lot of spam. I mean, information from me through announcements. <laughs> I don't know if you guys read it, but <laughs> all right, then same. Now it's your time to find the second best place on a Tuesday uh afternoon i guess it is but so thank you guys for for taking that step for being better professionals and growing personally and professionally see you next tuesday next tuesday we have another great speaker who is an anthropologist and remember all the econ classes that you took and you learned about importing and exporting and you're like well when am i going to use this or you only big businesses and we remember the containers well we have a small business owner who's importing and exporting artifacts from Africa mm. and what it takes for a small business to you know import from from Af all over Africa how long it takes so to plan her inventory so far in advance because the container needs to be filled needs to come really interesting and now how she's using her archaeology excuse me her anthropology background to help her in her marketing and understand her customers and the stories they want to be told through these artifacts so a very interesting guest speaker next week. So tune in um, and again, see you guys next week. Thank you guys. Great Thank meeting you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a great week. Have a great day, everyone.